Hey everybody, welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. And uh, today I'm honored to have on the guest Mitch Horowitz, who is a writer, an author, a lecturer, uh, and so much more really, uh, a fellow New Yorker, I have to say, uh, which is awesome. So uh, welcome to the show, Mitch. Thank you, man. Good to be here. Yeah, and you know, I'm really also honored that uh, that Jay Christopher King and I are going to have um, Mitch at our upcoming event um, in New York City, uh, an inquiry into anomalous experiences and the phenomenon. It's October 8th, New York City. The in-person tickets are already sold out, but you can still um, get live stream tickets if you're interested in, in watching. I think it's going to be an incredible event, so it's, it's really great to have you participate in that as well, Mitch. Delighted. It looks like a wonderful event. I'm, I'm very psyched and uh, glad to be collaborating with y'all. Yeah. And um, just just a headline to start that off. Do you want to tell people what you're going to be talking about there? I'll be talking about ESP research, which is something I care very deeply about. And uh, my contention is, and I'll um, focus on this in my presentation, that we present we, we possess as a human community, uh, probably at this point, uh, 80 some odd years plus of really beautifully done, impeccable, validated, academically based research into precognition, telepathy, uh, psychokinesis, uh, general ESP, mind to mind communication. And I contend that the case is closed. You know, we really have the evidence that there is an extra physical component of psyche. Uh, it falls to our generations to determine what we're going to do with that evidence. But uh, this research, which has been considered so controversial, uh, really no longer can be controversial in terms of its validity. Uh, with regard to its scientific validity, my contention is that th that era is, is now behind us and we have to start looking at ourselves uh, in terms of human nature as beings possessed of both a physical uh, and a metaphysical existence. Yeah, and, and what I love about that actually is that, you know, the UFO phenomenon in some ways is like, a, it's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Uh, for for um, ESP psychic phenomenon, uh, because, you know, here, you know, actually Jacques Vallée, he wrote a book called UFOs, The Psychic Connection. Yes. Uh, which was a, a superb book. And again, probably ahead of its time. And it's coming full circle now yes. as, yeah, because, you know, with, with the, the current UFO, point. yeah, the UFO disclosures that are going on right now, um, you know, it's just picking up momentum more and more and is going to continue to. And uh, in, in some of those disclosures, if we want to use the, it's kind of a loaded term, but it is what it is. Um, there was something that came out, it was called slide nine, and it was part of an uh, a Pentagon briefing slide presentation. And this slide is talking about all types of psychic phenomenon, but here it is in a DOD report yes. reporting on the UFO phenomenon and what they've observed and the data they've collected that regard all this kind of this, the psychic connection to it. So um, what is your thinking in this kind of current era we're in, this paradigm kind of shift we're going through in, in the middle of right now with UFOs being officially acknowledged and, and kind of with that comes all this other stuff, right? Yeah, it's really fascinating for me because I've dedicated most of my career to studying and writing about metaphysical experience, both historically, practically. And you could say that uh, the occult or, or belief in the existence of an unseen dimension of life coincides with or runs parallel to the UFO inquiry, but it's not specifically the same thing. And yet my thinking is a great deal like Jacques in that I am very interested in and lean towards understanding the UFO phenomena as interdimensional. And that's a case I make in a a book of essays that I have coming out shortly called Uncertain Places. And it seems to me that if we look at the question of craft 
from a, an extraterrestrial perspective. Obviously, we have to account for craft traveling vast, almost unthinkable distances. And we have conceptual models for that, like cosmic wormholes. But I would say at this particular stage of human development, our conceptual models for interdimensionality, while they're still theoretical, are better developed than our conceptual models for traveling vast, vast uh, distances. So if we use the Occam's razor approach, that the simplest answer that covers the greatest number of bases is likely to be right, that interests me in whether it's possible that uh, UFOs and other anomalous phenomena could be, could be encounters with intelligences or events from what we would call other dimensions or other intersections of time. And that might bring into play string theory. That might, that certainly brings into play um, quantum mechanics where we're faced with actual data of microcosmic objects be behaving in a very surrealistic way and following from that it stands to reason that objects can be at least on the atomic scale in an infinitude of positions at once until until perception enters the picture and when perception enters the picture the infinite becomes localized and that almost leads us to the inevitable logic that there are infinite events occurring at once. Well, where are they occurring? And, and this starts to marry to string theory and the question of different intersections of time, bending of space-time, uh, objects is existing in what we presently call different dimensions or, or different locations on these theorized bands of string. That could be, that could be uh, a response to uh, a resolution of the UFO phenomena, which brings us to a vast vista of questions much greater than anything we're facing right now. Um, that said, the interdimensional thesis and the extraterrestrial thesis are not mutually exclusive. We right. have a habit of human nature where we think that because we've explained one facet of something, we know the whole picture. And I often say it's like the mythical blind men describing an elephant. One, one blind man grabs the tail and says, it's a snake. Another blind man grabs the, 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 a leg and says, no, it's a tree. And another blind man grabs you know, the trunk or the ear and says, no, it's this. And the fact is they're all right, but they don't have the full picture. So because we've got one piece of the puzzle and we don't yet, but even if we get one piece of the puzzle, it doesn't necessarily solve the whole thing. So, uh, but that's that's my current thinking on on what the possibilities facing us may be. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, my own personal opinion at this point, um, you know, which I'm just open to growing in is that you know it's, it's we're possibly dealing with a, n a number of different phenomena and you know they kind of get lumped in sometimes into one category just because it goes into right. like, the the anomalous but and uh, you know some of what you're saying goes into like many worlds theory and all that exactly. and uh, what you're saying you mentioned uh your upcoming book on certain places and uh it's actually really cool two guests who have actually been on the show uh dean radin and Jacques Vallée both wrote a little blurb yeah. for that book, which is incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So congratulations on that. I'm really looking Thank forward you. to that. They've yeah. both been very, very big influences on me and, and their intellectual heroes to me. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of want to get into the idea of the occult and UFOs. And, you know, both could could be seen as loaded terms just because of all the, the preconceptions people have when they hear those words. Um, but in regards to UFOs and the occult, what um, what connection do you see there? Especially if we get into things like contact, right? Is something that we talk about on this channel. Contact with non-human intelligence is something that is embedded in into occult literature. Yes. You know, so what are what some of your thinkings on the occult and and UFOs and contact? Well, it's interesting that all of this is converging, or at least possibly so, right now in our generation. And as you were saying, one of the centerpieces of the occult outlook is communication with some kind of 
I would say extra physical or extra sensory kind of intelligence. And my definition of the occult is belief in an unseen dimension of life whose influences are felt on and through us. And one of the hallmarks of occultism is communication beyond our ordinary five senses. So for some of our ancestors, that might have been spirit or deity communication that still exists today. Obviously, modern occultism got popularized through the spiritualist movement, seances, talking to the dead. And then you had figures like Madame H.P. Blavatsky, who brought her narrative of being in touch with hidden adepts or masters who were said to be able to materialize a will or create phenomenal forms of communication, like phenomenally produced letters and this kind of thing. And I mean, there's so many different narratives going deep back into antiquity, biblical antiquity, and from other civilizations. I would venture there hasn't been a, a single human civilization on the planet that hasn't recorded communication with, relationship with, unknown entities. And you find that as a centerpiece uh, of hermetic spirituality, for example, which was a philosophy that grew out of ancient Greek and Egyptian culture intermingling in the city of Alexandria in the late stage of Egyptian civilization. And the notion being that the, the individual with proper awareness could be in touch with different uh, entities who might exist along what we might call the so-called band of strings. And a, a question that our generation faces, especially now that the UFO thesis is so heavily validated, is whether this is all part of the same conversation. And that's a very tantalizing question, which is a very still far away question. But, and 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 again, as we were alluding it, none of this is mutually exclusive uh, because, you know, let's say that someone makes a persuasive case for the interdimensional thesis. It doesn't, it doesn't belie belief in, in the extraterrestrial thesis as well or evidence of the extraterrestrial thesis, but these conversations all start to come a lot more closely together. And that to me is, is absolutely fascinating. Um, especially if one holds out a hope, as I do, that we will make continued strides in ESP or psychical research in our generation. There's such a dearth of funding for that research. It used to exist on a good many college campuses, Duke, Harvard, Cornell, Princeton, and it's very, very tough for those researchers to get funding, which is why Dean Radin, for example, is the chief scientist at an independent institute, the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Northern California. But my chief interest, I suppose, is in the metaphysical or the extra physical. I define spirituality as extra physicality. And again, these different inquiries run parallel, but it could be that we're starting to see a convergence. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because uh, Dean Radin is the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and that was actually founded by Dr. Edgar Mitchell, right. who was, you know, he had experiences. He did the experiment with the moon for the ESP experiment, right? Uh, which is incredible that he had the, the foresight or insight to do that. He had a samadhi experience while he was out in space. Yes. Of this oneness kind of experience. Um, but he was also like heavily involved with UFO disclosure. Yes. So, you know, that's another example of all this kind of converging in, in a modern history sense. So and, I, and one of the interesting things, just to just to continue on Edgar Mitchell for a moment, is that he famously attempted to conduct ESP experiments from space. And this, this was an important experiment to attempt in that I think we've come to understand that the ESP signal, so to speak, whatever it may be, it, it's not really comparable to a mental radio. It's completely unbound by time and space. 
And so Mitchell was seeking to affirm what earthbound experimenters had encountered. And uh, there are very few firm or solid answers that we have within the ESP experiment rubric. But I think one thing that all researchers agree on is that it, it's not really analogous to a kind of radio wave because it's completely unbound, not only by, by time and space, but by linearity. Uh, I write in Daydream Believer extensively about precognition experiments conducted by Daryl Bem at Cornell uh, U University on which he published a paper in 2011. And those experiments have since proved uh, confirmed by a meta-analysis pooling more than 90 different experiments from, let's see, 33 different labs, 14 different nations. And so we see demonstrations statistically in that case that precognition or retrocausality uh, is an actual documentable, statistically trackable uh, phenomena. And so Mitchell wanted to do this test from, from space, thereby strengthening the thesis that distance uh, in that case was not an issue. And his experiments uh, 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 seen from a certain perspective didn't go very well because there were problems with timing. And obviously when you're in a space capsule, you can't just say, hey fellas, uh, hang on a minute. I have something I need to do here, you know? And, and, and so they were unable to sync up quite as they wanted to. He, and this is a very interesting and, and subtle point. He didn't find um, the correlation, specifically speaking, that, that he was looking for. In other words, when you're asking somebody in an ESP experiment to make guess hits, let's say, on a, a deck of cards or some kind of target system, what you're looking for, obviously, is some deviation that goes above chance. But what he did find, interestingly enough, and this does occur sometimes in, in ESP experiments and people who work with the Global Consciousness Project, which originated at Princeton, have found this. I was just working with some of them uh, earlier this year in January, um, there is sometimes a negative correlation where the people who are attempting to uh, make hits actually come in at, at a, um, a negative uh, a correlation rate. I, I had that experience myself. Doesn't immediately sound like something to be proud of, but what you're looking for are deviations from statistical hit rates. And you assume that the deviations are always going to be over, but sometimes they come in under and that, that might represent something interesting to look at too. So that, that's what was found in, in Mitchell's experiments. Yeah, and um, the idea of uh, non-locality and consciousness and, and contact and even retro causality and, and things that we call uh, synchronicity are all something that really tie into the UFO phenomenon and contact. You know, I've, I've had my own experiences where there were just super synchronicities, just in like an insane level of like, there's no way in hell that this is happening kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for an on the record case, so to speak, you know, with a, with a Tic Tac, incident in 2004, the Tic Tac UFO incident, um, the object was able to, to be at the cap point, you know, as it was communicated. So whether that's a kind of telepathic or precognition or some other insane way that they were able to unencrypt classified information on the spot, which is randomized. Mm -hmm. You know, I, either is fascinating, but again, that's the, the interesting point about the why you know I really appreciate the UFO subject, other than having contact, is that you know here are you know seemingly physical objects that are demonstrating these non-physical principles. You know, so it, there's a track to it, which is is uh, fascinating. Yes. Um, but you you mentioned um, Princeton. Uh, di I, I I think maybe it was this, what you're talking about. A few months ago, I thought maybe 
you posted something about random number generators? Yes, that okay. was in January. Yeah, I was hanging out with some of the guys uh, who came out of the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab uh, at a conference in Miami in January. Can you talk about what you were doing there? Oh, sure. I, I gave a talk called ESP Case Closed, and it really its a talk I'm very proud of. Uh, it's up on YouTube right now. And I was nervous about giving it because I was speaking to an audience mostly of tech people, venture capitalists, uh, people who you would think of as coming from a materialistic point of view, but they were very receptive to it. And it was uh, what I justly considered a tough audience, but they were they were really very receptive. And I was able to have conversations afterwards with people who brought to the table real skepticism. And that's what is so enriching to me. I want to debate with skeptics. I want to engage with skeptics, but it can't be this kind of polemical skepticism where they keep moving the goalpost or playing word games or flipping the chessboard over uh, if the debate isn't going their way. I, I really think that we've reached a point where that's just, it's tiresome, it's, it's, it's unnecessary. And unfortunately, it's, it's really hard to get around, especially when you're somebody like me who wants to debate with skeptics. And there was one guy afterwards who said to me, uh, you know, the, the problem that you face in trying to drum up funding for academic ESP research is applicability. And I said, you're absolutely right. And applicability is one of the chief problems. Of course, we could all talk about possible models of applicability. And some people have talked about this. A statistician named Jessica Utz at UC Irvine does a good job of this. And, 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 and there are models of applicability. But as an advocate of that research, I have to concede it is one of the weaker areas. And he said to me, you know, the, 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 the issue is, if I accept all your arguments, and, and he seemed sympathetic to them. He said, you have basically an engine that works 10% of the time. And I said, yes, you know, that's, that is true. And that is a fair statement. Uh, I mean, we're speaking metaphorically, but the ESP effect is one that it comes and goes conditionally. And that's an issue for application. And some researchers, including Charles Onerton, who was a very great man who died in 1996, he was attempting to determine whether there were circumstances under which the ESP effect spikes. And he had success with his experiments, which are called the Gansfeld experiments, which is German for open field. And Onerton's innovation is that he and his colleagues would place people into conditions of comfortable sensory deprivation, like in a depro tank. And he would find that the ESP effect did spike in those conditions. Um, and, and, and yet we're still talking about something that's very conditional, that is in some regards, uh, 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 at least colloquially, a very small deviation from chance, and yet a consistent and very positive measurable deviation, and a deviation that when you're dealing with a statistical models is actually quite significant, especially within the social sciences. But, but uh, with regard to application, one has to concede the point that we're still talking about something that is like a, you know, will o' the wisp. It's really hard to get a grip on when it's going to occur, when it's not going to occur. In fact, another um, friend and, and person I admire greatly is uh, uh, the scholar of religions, Jeff Kripal. And Jeff uh, has said to me, look, you know, um, I think you're in the wrong place looking for ESP in the laboratory. Uh, it seems to me if you want the ESP effect to go away, the best thing you could do is venture into the laboratory. You will find much more compelling evidence in testimony and people talking about crisis apparitions, precognitive dreams, just extraordinary events that, as you were alluding, completely elude the law, so-called law of large numbers and this kind of thing. And Jeff's contention is that the laboratory model for tracking the ESP effect is, is outdated. And he feels 
you know, guys like me are still trying to kind of perfect the mousetrap. And his attitude is, look, you know, okay, we got the mousetrap, you know, you got to move on from this. And that's a very legitimate criticism as well. And if we, if those of us who care about ESP research are going to dispense with the laboratory model, what comes next? And those are interesting questions. These are the kinds of things uh, uh, we were debating at that conference. And these are the kinds of things I want to debate because I think we've reached a point after you know 80, 90 years or so where arguing about polluted data is really an outdated concept unless one just has a really polemical intent, which is the case for most of the professional skeptics. I mean, it's 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 an intellectual graveyard because these guys just want to keep going over debates yeah. that were settled in the 1940s and it's a drag, you know, and they can do it. Um, they're, they're certainly successful at doing it, but it it doesn't serve the cause of human knowledge. Right. And, uh, you know, a very interesting point about the skepticism, because you had the same kind of deal in the UFO subject where the yeah. some of the UFO skeptics are, you know, I, I, they're obfuscating the questions. They're not directly trying to engage in the conversation in the way of progress. It's more of like a, just like muddying the waters. It, it, it really seems. is. And, and it's intentional. You know, it's intentional. Right. And, and it's really unfortunate. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if it's that they have some plot or it's just a defense mechanism where it, it, it threatens their belief system and worldview so much that they have no other way to respond. Uh, I, I, I think that that's an interesting question. And I must say, um, when I deal with the skeptics, and I do deal with them a fair amount, um, I hit my limits of understanding human nature. I really, yeah. really do. <laughs> it, it, you know, I will in private sometimes be engaging with a skeptic and in private, they may concede key data. They may say, well, yeah, you're right. The Gonsfeld experiments were pretty remarkable. Uh, we may get to a place where they're unwilling to concede the ESP thesis, but they'll grant that the data uh, the, the key data is unpolluted and that we have more work to do. And that's all I want. Yeah, I just want there to be an atmosphere where we can work unimpeded towards real questions. And then I've literally had the circumstance where 24 hours, 48 hours later, they'll totally reverse themselves. They'll go back into their peer group. They'll get reverse habituated and they'll change their tune. And I'm not a cynic. You know, I'm, I'm just not a cynic. And I have trouble understanding what fuels a person across the arc of his or her career to be carrying on that way? I, I could I can come up with some pretty good reasons, and and you were making reference to some of them. People don't like having their worldview shaken. I don't like having my worldview shaken. I would certainly not like waking up on a Thursday morning and finding out that I've been dedicating myself to an illusion. You know, I can understand <laughs> the psychological yeah. difficulty of that, and I'm not unsympathetic to it, but. I do feel that if you really are going to claim the title skeptic, which is a noble title, uh, you can't be a closet cynic calling yourself a skeptic. There has to be some idealism there. And um, when I don't find it, and there are many times where I don't find it, I, I hit my limits of human nature. Yeah. I guess it's and tribalism, and whatever that it's, is. Uh, it's the human condition. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, even with self-investigation and vipassana and all you know all the practices we do our best to be our best and and try to understand those things but you know that's that's all we can do yeah the self the self work you work on yourself and you know help to do service where you can out in the world um but i, I do think that there is a tide shift with again the the what's what's going on with the ufo or uap disclosures is I, I want to say slowly, but it's actually, you know, considering the, an entire worldview, it's actually moving pretty fast. You know, I think you're right. Yeah. All things considered. Um, but it's it's funny, too. One thing that you mentioned is the working unimpeded. And, you know, to talk about the UFO subject and even psychic research, because, as you know, Jacques Vallée and others help put off um who was working with Stargate and the CIA psychic program, um, they had something called the Invisible College, 
And the funny thing about that is Heineck took that name from Rosicrucianism. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Sir Francis Bacon. So yeah. that's a, that, an incredibly interesting tie-in. Yeah. Um, that that Valet and Heineck um, had an interest in, in Rosicrucianism and what it can oh, yeah. offer possibly. Oh, yeah. um, so because they early on saw the connection because all these Stargate remote viewers who were getting really good hits in, again, if you're talking about an application, the intelligence services were using this and succeeding for 20 years and getting some amazing hits. But again, there's a thing of unre unreliability and the idea is if you can't explain how it's happening, a lot of people will just give it to, you know, say, oh, it's a, it's Absolutely. lucky. And, and, and it, that, it's a tough, it's a tough question. It really is. It's, it's a very tough question. And, and what you're really bringing us to is the question of theory and our scientific culture relies upon theory and in fact almost over relies upon theory one could argue but i do think there has to be a theoretical model a kind of delivery system uh, within psychical research and we have made some strides in that direction but progress is really overdue and it's a tough one because my um, I guess my my chief intellectual hero is J.B. Ryan, who opened the parapsychology lab at Duke University in the early 1930s. And J.B. labored for decades to amass replicable statistical evidence for uh, ESP. And in fact, J.B.'s birthday is coming up on September 29th, and I've written a, a major piece in, in defense of J.B., uh, which is based on material from, from Daydream Believer, and JB's statistical work is impeccable. But he was asked by certain supportive, constructive critics, look, you need to come up with a delivery system, and JB felt that wasn't his job. He felt, I'm a statistician. My job is to assemble evidence. I'll leave it to social philosophers. I'll leave it to metaphysical philosophers to consider a delivery system. And I personally consider that a, a mistake. I think that if you're going to engage with the scientific method, as I often like to say, uh, the theory is your in-laws. You, you may or may not like your in-laws, but you're gonna have to deal with them at some point, you know? So <laughs> Thanksgiving comes and, you know, are, are we inviting Mabel and Frank or not, you know, and why not or why, you know? So, so, so if you're gonna engage on that level, you're gonna have to regard a theory as your in-laws. And I don't think that those of us who advocate psychical research have made sufficient progress in that regard. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I've, I've been harping on, on the UFO because this is engaging the phenomenon. So we deal with UFOs, sure. but we also deal with consciousness and ESP because, um, I, I, again, with engaging the phenomenon, a subtitle for that I, I kind of have is it's an inclusive approach to the UFO phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, uh, you know, the occult and consciousness, I've, I've studied this stuff for almost 20 years now. Uh, even longer, if you want to include firsthand experiences with all this kind of stuff, um, basically my whole life. So to me, it's obvious. It's, you know, it's obvious that it's, I, I, and I hate to say it in this way, but it, that it's all connected. But it, it, it really is in some way, right? Some people will argue that the kind of um, convergence point is consciousness. Maybe that's our best current understanding. Uh, it's hard to say, you know, even like the Akashic field or, you know, mm -hmm. you can get into all these ideas. And again, we, we really don't know. Uh, but th there is something that kind of is gluing this stuff together. And I, I want to get into some of your incredible work on the occult. Mm -hmm. um, but just to kick off first, um, because I do deal a lot with uh, contact you know, not just contact occurring, but the idea that you can facilitate a contact, a close encounter, you know, if, if that's something that you're open to, you know, and I'm just going to put a disclaimer out there, uh, because, you know, for whatever, because you don't know what's going to happen. Right. You know, personally, personally, the majority of my experiences have been positive. And I can't explain why that is. I know people, 
that I take their word for it. They had negative experiences. And I don't know why, why, why that is. I can speculate and I have ideas as to why that is, but I don't know. And I, I want to respect and, and take in what they're saying. So my, my experience with contact has generally been positive, kind of like awakening, um, you know, even, even though at first they may have been like a, like a big hit, like shit, it will kind of mess your stuff up for a little. You could even have, you know, I could see some people having something of uh, a psychotic break mm -hmm. and having to kind of integrate what that means for your reality, mm -hmm. you know, and not, not just like, oh, there's other entities, but they're communicating with you psychically or telepathically. And what does that mean about the universe and your place mm -hmm. in it, the human potential and so on. Um, before we move on to some of your other work with the occult, um, for people that are that are just guns blazing, they're interested in contact. Uh, you know, with all disclaimers out in the front, are you familiar with any methods in the occult of contact with non-human intelligence? Well, I would say one method that I am super interested in because it's simple. And I really believe in the efficacy of simple methods um, is using the state of what is sometimes called hypnagogia. And hypnagogia is this very exquisitely relaxed state that we all enter in just before drifting to sleep at night. And then just as coming to in the morning, in that case, it's sometimes called hypnopompia. There, there might be more sensory experience going on during hypnagogia versus hypnopompia in the morning, but there's similar states. And <clears throat> this was the state that Charles Onerton attempted to use in his Gonsfeld experiments, in which he would place people into conditions of comfortable sensory deprivation. So for example, he might sit you in an easy boy recliner in a noise proof room with headphones on emitting white noise with eye shades blocking out light. And he felt that if you could reduce the stimuli of everyday life, which has only grown since we've all become addicted to our handheld devices, you might be able to spike the ESP effect. And the ESP effect, by definition, is anything that goes outside of ordinary sensory experience. So we're sharing and receiving information in a way that exceeds our normal linear sensory experience, that exceeds our known technology. And I use that state for example, for the recitation of mantras or affirmations. Uh, pro I, I also practice transcendental meditation, which I think places the individual into a state of hypnagogia. It's different from, from that which I've been describing, but I value this because we all enter into it naturally. So if a person feels meditation is not for me, I'm not able to do this. You are able to do it if you are able to go to sleep at night, which of course is not something we all possess in the 21st century, but those of us that do, um, uh, we enter this, this state naturally in a 24 hour period. That has proven to be prime time for an ESP related effect. And I think also for self-suggestion for reprogramming the mind, which was a use that was uh, pioneered by a French mind theorist named Emile Coué, who was very popular in the early 20th century. He died in 1926. So if somebody is interested in prompting some sort of extra sensory experience, broadly defined, that state of hypnagogia seems to me to be prime time for making that effort. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting you mentioned the hypnagogia too, because um, the um, I think the, the Monroe Institute, some of their their tapes and stuff, they they talk about the different states, and uh, that gets into what people call the binaural tones and and the delta tones. Delta is supposed to be REM sleep, but you know it's going to get you into the hypnagogic state. So yes, you know whether you're using a mantra, which is more traditional, or the binaural tones. I think those are both methods that are going to facilitate the kind of um, EEG brain waves that coincide with hypnagogia. So yeah, I think I there's a, a, a correlation there. Maybe not causation, but definitely correlation. Um, and I, you know, I was involved in, or am 
however you want to say it, in something. It's called CE5, and Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. It's got a very bad rep because of the person who coined the term is a highly controversial figure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, Dr. Stephen Greer, I'll just say it. Mm -hmm. uh, he had some mishaps, and unfortunately, that's taken the whole idea of the process of what he has basically just highlighted because contact with non-human intelligence and the methods thereof go back as far as you look back into time there's different models and examples of that you know even uh, the, the recent one uh, a more recent one in the last few hundred years which Jacques Vallée wrote about was John D and the Nokian tables you know it's, yes it's a different it's a different thing but it's it's we're talking about the same kind of communication with the non-human intelligence yes um so i find that fascinating um but to get more into your work you know and you're you're obviously human but you're some something something of a machine <laughs> so i don't know if you're a hybrid <laughs> hybrid or an android or a demon spiritual entity with high intelligence um you, you have a new book out, but you have two other new books coming out. Uh, yeah. So let's let, let's start with uh, Daydream Believer. Can you, for people listening who are interested in some of the ideas we've been talking about beyond just say like a physical UFO, we have, you know, that represents on a larger scale and a bigger picture, the paradigm shift of non-physical reality or the occult or new thought. Mm -hmm. um, and all these, they're actually ancient ideas, but Yes, we're, we're seeing that the, everything come full circle and almost to fruition at this point. It's like, wow, even science is talking about other dimensions and and we're seeing all this take place now. It's like just being discovered on the, on the physical sense, which is fascinating. Um, so for, for people that are interested in this kind of it's cutting edge, really, um, that things that people experience it intuited, but now we're we're actually getting to the measurement aspect or observation aspect scientifically of. Um, can you explain to people your book, um, Daydream Believer? Sure. Uh, I've always been very interested in new thought or the philosophy of mind causation. And popularly speaking, this will go under terms like uh, law of attraction or power of positive thinking or the secret all of which I have problems with, but none of which I spend time being excessively resistant to. Uh, those aren't my terms, and those philosophies intersect with, but but diverge from my own. And nonetheless, um, New Thought has done a good job of popularizing itself, and I celebrate that, but it has not done a commensurate job of maturation, of refining itself, of coming up with a a theology of suffering, of understanding that mind causation effects can still be real without being the only game in town. I don't use the term law of attraction, for example, because I don't like the implication that we all exist under one mental super law. Awareness, the psyche, intellect, consciousness, whatever one wants to call it, may be may be the ultimate arbiter of reality. And I, I believe it, 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 it probably is. At the same time, we live within a physical model that requires us to suffer many different laws and forces, including mortality itself, including physical decline. There's no exception to that. And except at very, very maybe unique moments in the human experience. So I'm trying to help as I'm able, as a seeker. I'm trying to accelerate New Thought's maturation in the same way that it's become so popular, often under these some of these different names. It also needs to refine itself. And so Daydream Believer is my best effort at this point in my search to write a book about mind power from both a historical, theoretical, and practical perspective that has intellectual solidity, that has gravity, that deals with everything that we've come to learn from the hard sciences, and that deals with the persistence of catastrophe and suffering, which are very real things that can't be explained away, 
um, that can't be regarded as exceptions or mistakes, but are, 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 are arterial to our lives that need to coexist with the mind power model. So it's my best effort to uh, take new thought into a, a, what I hope is a graduated stage and create a book that people who are very discriminating and thoughtful and searching and probing uh, can read and say, this is a philosophy by which I might be able to uh, live my life. Yeah, I appreciate and I applaud that because, you know, we have the same issue, say, with the UFO phenomenon and the credibility aspect of uh, the maturity. Yeah. The popularity is, is especially now getting there. But the maturity of the conversation, I actually feel it is getting there. Um, but to, to some extent, I mean, there's some of the, hmm, I don't want to be overcritical, yeah. but, you know, there's, there's a large group of people who are looking at the UFO subject and maybe even new thought as a form of entertainment. Yeah. Whereas there's other people uh, who are very serious about it, who are practitioners, who take it very seriously, who are inquisitive, who are even skeptical, but skeptical believers, so to speak. And, and that's very powerful. And, you know, I think we are, we are making strides, say, in the UFO subject, as, as you're talking about with the new thought subject. And I think that's important. And, uh, you know, something I find fascinating, because honestly, I, I've never heard of Neville Goddard before before you had mentioned him. Yeah, I have him tattooed yeah. right here, actually. That is that is so cool. So <laughs> I'm, I'm only beginning to get into his stuff just now. He's uh, remarkable. Because, He's yeah. absolutely remarkable. Yeah. Be because of your work and some of the ideas you're talking about with New Thought. I think I think it was John Wheeler who who from Princeton that you mentioned Pear Labs mm -hmm. that that mentioned uh, the participatory universe. Yes. And to right. me, like that just struck, like, of course, that's how it works. Yes. Um, so, and I think, does Neville Goddard strike on those strings, so to speak? Oh, without question. Neville, for anybody who doesn't know him, uh, he was a British Barbadian mystic who lived and worked for much of his life in the U.S. He died in 1972. And he was a figure who I think could be called somewhat obscure. But uh, thanks to the fact that during his lifetime, he permitted listeners to freely record his lectures in the digital age, his lectures became vastly popular online. And his philosophy, on one hand, is very simple, but very compelling. Neville is uh, an extreme idealist, and his philosophically speaking, and his contention is that your imagination is the force symbolically referred to as God in scripture, and that everything that you experience, including my words right now, is a result of the outpicturing of your own mental images and emotionalized thoughts. So that if one were to follow Neville's philosophy to its logical extent, um, it could be said right now that uh, there's no Mitch um, here, uh, there's no James here, that your listeners, uh, any given listener who's uh, uh, engaged in this conversation right now uh, is the creator of what's going on. We are just figments of your own intellect, of your own psyche. These are not my ideas. These are not James's ideas. These are your ideas, and you are just ready to experience them for whatever reason at this moment, and you have uh, effectively created us as figments of this field of experience that you are in charge of that that you are producing whether knowingly or not from your own emotionalized thoughts that's neville's contention and it's one of these arguments that thinking people uh, uh, immediately want to uh, dispute find exceptions to say what about this what about that and yet when you read neville and when you listen to neville he he so elegantly articulates and defends this radical metaphysic that he has won a huge, huge and very wide ranging uh, number of fans. I had a couple of people from Pear come up to me at this conference and say, oh, I really appreciate your turning me on to Neville Goddard. And I was like, you guys are into Neville because it's a, it's a very, very radical metaphysic. And yet he had that ability 
uh, which was possessed by very few modern figures, maybe one of them was Emerson, maybe one of them was Krishnamurti, to describe radical inner experience in a way that was totally persuasive. And his philosophy, in a certain sense, was very simple. He restated it in, in, in thousands of lectures, over 10 books, over the course of his career. And each time he stated it, it sounded fresh. It sounded new. It sounded like you were hearing it for the very first time. And one of the things that I've made note of is that before uh, quantum mechanics, quantum theory was popularized, Neville in the 1940s was speaking the language of quantum physics in a certain way, long before we had the popularizations. And I think Neville is the most elegant mystical analog to quantum theory. So anybody who's into questions of perception and whether how perception measurement create reality or create locality, uh, Neville is your man. Neville is somebody to look at for a philosophical a backbone to that point of view. Yeah. And, you know, again, you know, disclaimer, I'm going to be, I'm using loaded terms here, uh, but in a way, just so I can communicate a simple yeah. idea, which people can understand is this, this whole thing about disclosure, you know, UFO disclosure, and, and therein the disclosure of, of so much more really um, is, you know, you could think of it almost in like a collective consciousness participatory event where it's finally on a collective level, we've, we've reached a threshold where we're ready for that kind of self-transformation, which is not just about UFOs. The UFO is the catalyst. It's the object, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's a spark of transformation for understanding ourselves and the greater universe, our place in it on, on such a deep level that it, I think, you know, post-disclosure, looking back, you know, you know, 30 years after it occurs, we're going to see we're transformed beings, basically. We have a transformed consciousness, not, not only individually, but collectively. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's a disclosure more of just this kind of object, uh, this intelligence, but, you know, something much greater. And, you know, that's something that uh, Dr. John Mack of Harvard University, the head of the psychiatry department, kind of discussed with his, his book and theme of the passport to the cosmos, because the, the contact is is a, a transformative kind of event. And yeah, if you want to get into the cult aspect of it, it's like the phoenix, you know, mm -hmm. who is born again into this this luminous being. It's the the transformation. Uh, and again, if you're somebody who's had contact, you've probably had that on a personal level. You've had an awakening. You've had a mm -hmm. transformation, and when we have this on a collective level, it's it's almost unfathomable. Yeah, it, <laughs> so. it raises such amazing questions about human nature and how we communicate and how we share in experiences. You know, I mean, you had a couple of tribes in the Mediterranean basin who were monotheistic, and 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 suddenly you reach a tipping point in history where monotheism. Uh, sweeps the world. You could say it was brutal power. You could say it was truth. My assumption would be that it's a complexity of factors. Um, likewise, uh, 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 somewhat contemporaneous to our era, you know, we have a commercial pilot out in Washington State who sees a flying disc, and suddenly everybody starts seeing flying discs. And of course, the hardened skeptic will say, well, you know, it's just the power of suggestion, but then it's the same guy who will tell me there's no such thing as the power of suggestion, you know, and so, <laughs> you know, what's, what's going down, you, you know, I, I'm fascinated with how ideas go viral, you could say it's just an empirical fact, whatever uh, Kenneth Arnold was experiencing, other people began to experience because we were, we were turning a corner, but how ideas go viral is, is one of the uh, perennial mysteries of human nature. Yeah, and that and that gets into the ideas of like Rupert Sheldrake's morphogenetic fields. Yes, the hundredth hundredth monkey effect, and uh, you know, once you know, the idea that you know when an invention happens, it spontaneously happened non locally on the planet with people that had no form of communication. Uh, you know, these are all things that should raise red flags or you know areas of interest. I think. Yeah. Um, 
which which I think in the past were written off more, but I, th I think in, in kind of where we're headed, it's, it's going to be looked at in a more profound way. Um, I'm hoping, right? I'm optimistic. I'm optimism. Well, look, yeah. you know, uh, uh, um, we're going to, we have a front row seat uh, to see what happens in the ensuing years. I, I, in uncertain places, I read about having been at the Guggenheim Museum in summer of 2019 for a panel they had on the UFO experience. And the curator came up to me afterwards and he said, look, uh, at what point do you think it's going to become intellectually embarrassing for people to just out of hand dismiss the UFO thesis? And I thought for a moment, I said, honestly, right now, right at this instant, we're living through that moment. I don't think anybody serious in our culture, I don't think anybody intellectually serious at this stage could wave off the UFO thesis and say, you know, oh, swamp gas. Uh, imagination, hallucination, little green men, you know, it, 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 it's part of the firmament of our culture right now. And we've just witnessed that over the past handful of years. So what's going to happen next week? You know, we all have a front row seat. Some yeah. of us are on the field, you know, it's pretty heavy. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I suspect that uh, we're, we're going to get a lot more not it's there's not going to be a slowing down i think we've, we've passed the point of no return oh, i think no I'm, question i'm going to be corrected in that statement even within the next coming months i mean and, it's funny I, I i if i may you know i'm speaking just culturally but uh now and again you know i'll see uh bill clinton or barack obama on late night television shows and somebody will invariably ask the ufo question and they're engaging this question in a serious way as we're engaging it right now you know there's not some you know laughing or cynical hand waving or saying oh you know i don't know and uh i, I mean you couldn't fathom that when i was a kid you, you you know you couldn't fathom it although there were wisps of it you know there there you know you did have a gerald ford or a jimmy carter uh uh saying something serious publicly and on the record or or criticizing the defense department for being indirect on the matter which was a criticism that gerald ford had but to see these guys in a public forum routinely talking this way, that was unknown to me when I was a kid. You know, if I talked about UFOs as a kid, I'd get sent to the principal's office. And, and now you've got ex-presidents on TV talking about it as a matter of routine. Um, the cultural changes have been so overwhelming, we can almost miss them. We can almost miss them because they've been so overwhelming so quickly. Yeah. And um, I mean, we could do an entire podcast just talking about the changes that have occurred since December 16th, 2017, mm -hmm. because when the New York Times article dropped, with Leslie King, Ralph Blumenthal and Helena Cooper, that sparked kind of everything. I think that, of course, for decades before there had been things building up, but that was the thing that broke the dam and got the toothpaste out or however you want to it, say it. It broke the dam. Yeah. And yeah. about, I don't know, maybe 18 months ago, you and I'm sure uh, uh, many of your, your listeners uh, read it. There was an extensive article about disclosure in uh, the New Yorker magazine. And I'm reading the whole thing and I'm saying, I'm waiting for the zinger. I'm waiting for the zinger where we all get <laughs> called nuts. Where yeah. is it, you know, and it never came. It yeah. never came. And that is a huge cultural change. I mean, you really wouldn't have seen that even two, three years earlier. And uh, thanks to to Leslie and, and, and Ralph and Helene's uh, efforts and those of others, um, you, you can find an article like that in one of the opinion shaping journals of the world. And it's so funny because I, I, I'm always saying to myself, whenever there's an article about an esoteric topic, you know, broadly speaking, in a mainstream journal, I feel like I'm getting measured out for my coffin. You know, at a certain point, I'm gonna find <laughs> out that all these nice conversations are just leading up to me and my friends being called nuts. And that didn't happen. And again, the cultural changes have been so swift and overwhelming, they're easy to miss. Cause it's like we're swimming in a different body of water all of a sudden. Yeah, and, and just for people listening, um, some may be familiar that there's been legislation written um, in several occasions over the last several years, and the most recent one being a few months ago put into the intelligence bill for 2023, and they're asking for all the NDAs of people who are involved, or they give whistleblower immunity to people that are involved directly with programs or who have classified data on the subject can testify privately to Congress in a classified setting. Um, they want answers. They're they're asking for language 
Uh, they have language that's asking for if, if the, the public has been dissuaded from the subject, who was involved and why was it done? They're asking for materials of retrieved objects, um, technology transfers to national labs. I mean, it, it's, in, it, it's, it's in writing. Uh, they're going for broke. And it's because they're pissed that they know they've been lied to and they, they know now because I guess they've been speaking to people that are on the inside who have the, the information. And what comes of that is gonna be pretty incredible. Um, and again, somebody else who's going to be at the the conference with us is is Dr. Gary Nolan, and he he's he's been doing really incredible work um, for you know what you can say UFO disclosure. He's an experiencer himself. Uh, he's also a Nobel Prize nominee. He's an incredible scientist, uh, but he's also very open minded and. Um, you know, even on the other, if, you know, again, I can't speak on his behalf and I, he's always talking about that whatever data is preliminary is preliminary and not to draw conclusions. So I'm gonna state that as a disclaimer, um, but his, his work with the, the caudate pertainment and the caudate nucleus and tracking a physical area where it's possible that intuition, or, intuition occurs in, you know, is incredible. And, the people involved with that research were some of them were remote viewers, other and 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 some of them were people who had you know alleged UFO experiences within the military service. So it was all recorded. Um, so that and and he wrote a, a paper to to the committees trying to kind of make the case for academics being involved mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. in the in the subject, which is mm -hmm. something that I believe is going to happen. Yes, uh, and something we're going to be hearing about in the yep. next few months. Um, and he he wrote a white paper, you know, suggesting that we need the academics working on this, you know, so it's just out of just the strong grip of the military. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, you know, to move to move on to that. Sorry for that small rant. That was just like a UFO. No, not at all. And I, I I appreciate the tone you're bringing to this because one of the things that I um, want to say to the UFO community is that we need to be capable of taking a victory lap. Uh, uh, there, there, there's so much understandable um, frustration, anger at the years of non-disclosure and at the attempts to thwart disclosure. And I understand that and I feel all that too, but we've got to be willing to take a victory lap and say, as much as I'm averse to using terms like paradigm shift, because they're overused, we have entered a, a paradigm shift. I think we can justly say that at this phase. And we're not too far from Halloween at this time of year. I always know it's Halloween when yeah. journalists start calling me and they're like, do you think there's an occult revival going on? And the occult's an evergreen. So I don't speak in terms of occult revivals but at the, in our age. But at the same time, I, I'm starting to answer that question in the affirmative because we're 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 seeing questions of of consciousness and and disclosure which have run on parallel tracks but are converging i think as we've been uh, alluding um come to the forefront of 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 western life in ways that i haven't seen in my lifetime and we have to be willing to take a victory lap and say this has been a, an enormously long road and the ufo topic is mainstream literally like it's never been before at any other point in modern history and that didn't happen by accident so let the movement just chill for a moment and raise a glass you know yeah it's warranted yeah. it's warranted yeah and sometimes i say you know the, the ufo is like a bridge between physics and metaphysics absolutely and yeah. I, I think we're going to be seeing kind of more of that i think that we're only moving forward from here um I did, I did, you know, you have, I believe, uh, two other books coming out. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> you have, so let's can, just briefly for people listening, they're probably fascinated by these subjects by now of us talking <laughs> about it. Um, Uncertain Places. What is that book about? Uncertain Places is a collection of essays into occult and esoteric topics, and it represents probably the culmination of my encounter with these topics 
over the past 20 years. So I'll deal with ESP research, uh, UFOs, interdimensionality, occult history, uh, a practice. And occult history is something that is a kind of neglected history that helps us understand who we are. Like you were saying that Jacques Vallée and Alan Hynek uh, made direct reference to the Rosicrucian thought movement. And, 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 and not only do they have interest there, but we see combinative interests in occult philosophy and human advances in knowledge occurring uh, throughout the arc of history. For example, a lot of the figures in the Western world who validated the existence of a, a geocentric solar system in which the sun moves around the earth rather than vice versa, they were very deeply steeped themselves in hermeticism where that idea already existed as a metaphysical philosophy. So um, uh, uh, Copernicus, um, 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 uh, Giordano Bruno, um, Kepler, they were expressly interested, Bruno in particular, in uh, hermetic philosophy, this ancient Egyptian Greek philosophy, which had as an article of faith uh, a, a heliocentric system, which, which, which Bruno gave his life uh, trying to bring into the, 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 the Western uh, pre-enlightenment, just pre-enlightenment worldview. And uh, he succeeded, although tragically was murdered uh, for, for his heterodox views. So there are many areas of confluence between uh, leaps in, in human progress and, and vestiges of threads of, of occult history. So that's, that's a component of the book as well. Yeah, and wasn't wasn't uh, Isaac Newton involved with the the Emerald oh, sure. Tablets? I, Isaac Newton wrote the first English translation of the Hermetic text, the Emerald Tablet, which is where we get the principle "as above, so below." Probably the the most widely quoted, widely known maxim from Hermeticism. Uh, Newton was interested in alchemy. He was interested in Hermeticism. Uh, today, we use the term Newtonian to describe a very specific kind of mechanics, but Newton wanted people to stand <laughs> on his shoulders, not to turn his philosophy into an orthodoxy of its own. Yeah, that, I, I, and that's fascinating. Um, and so also, you have another book uh, coming out. It's called Modern Occultism. What oh, yes, that's that's coming out next summer. Uh, that's coming out in June of 2023, and that is... Uh, what I hope will be a really epic, sweeping history of modern occult thought. I, I, my use of the term modern is anything that is post-antiquity. So I'll go back to antiquity, to the final stages of Egyptian civilization. So as I said recently on social media, and it's very true, it goes from Cleopatra to chaos magic. So it really yeah. is a very ambitious arc of history in 12 chapters. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And, uh, you know, how do you do it all? How do you? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm asked that a lot. And, and the best possible response I can give is, is passion. It's passion for the subject matter. I, I care very, very deeply about the subject matter. I'm never so alive and so happy as when I'm communicating and writing on metaphysical topics. Um, I didn't publish my first book, Occult America, until I was about age 43, going on 44. So I never take it for granted. I'm 56 now. And I never take for granted the opportunity to speak to people, to present, to write. And so there's a passion that fuels me. And that that seems to uh, bend space time. And so I'm able yeah. to get a lot of stuff done see you know kind of an almost in a serious way it's it's incredible uh you know um what you said there and um for for other, for the audience for people listening for you know who we could say fellow seekers uh do you have a, a message a parting message or any words of insight for for anybody listening whether they're interested in ufos the occult human potential or what have you I would say honor the search, honor the search and allow your passions to guide you. Don't get taken in by internalized peer pressure. Sometimes we say to ourselves, I have to read this. I have to read that. I have to look into this. I have to look into that because that's what everybody's talking about. And yeah, you need to know what your peers are doing, but I think it's okay 
to just totally honor your passions. If one of the names we've mentioned today, whether it's John Mack or Krishnamurti or Emerson or whomever, or Jeff Kripal, turns you on, then just 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 go and read their books. Don't don't feel too hemmed in by uh, by by order or by neatly drawn steps. Uh, allow yourself to be a little anarchic. That's how the mind grows. Sure and. Uh... Where could people find your work? I, I'll, I'm going to have links in the description so people can find it. Just but for people listening, where could they find your work? Well, my website is MitchHorowitz.com, but I stay most up to date on social media. I'm on Twitter at Mitch Horowitz and on Instagram at Mitch Horowitz 23. And of course, my books are all up at um, Amazon or any place you buy your books. Yeah, you, you type in Mitch Horowitz, you're going to be directed to all. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. I, and what you said about you publishing your first book at like 43, 44 is yeah. that, it's very hopeful for me because I'm 35. I haven't written my first book yet. Hope to. Um, so that gives me great hope. Um, oh, yeah. And I want I always I always try to point that out to people because I, I had walked away from writing at a certain point in my life. I didn't rediscover it until I was about 36. And 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 things began to happen really dramatically. Sometimes it's a matter of simply finding the right topic. There was a point in my life I didn't know what I wanted to write about. And then when I realized I wanted to write about the metaphysical, it was like a light went on. So it, it can happen at, at, at any time. It just requires a lot of dedication, passion, sweat equity. Definitely. Well, Mitch, it, it's been a true honor speaking to you. I could I could easily talk to you all day, you know. <laughs> Uh, honored to have you on and i'm Pleasure. really it's it's really it's incredible to have you and you know as a fellow new yorker participating in this event coming up october 8th um and it, um you know an inquiry into anomalous experiences in the phenomenon it's, it's going to be amazing to have you there it's going to be amazing to meet you in person um i'm psyched that, thank you you know uh so you know thank you so much for coming on and i hope to speak to you again soon i'll be seeing you soon absolutely a pleasure thank you so much all right. Take care, Mitch. Take care.